glad to be here. I actually was with um, Nuri, gosh, maybe a couple years ago, um, taking some coursework from the Lake Erie Institute and thinking deeply about um, some of the, the questions you are. So I'm glad to be back in community with you all. Um, I uh, am here in Colorado um, on um, Southern Ute land where I was born and raised. Um, I've done a lot of work in sustainability and climate over the past seven or eight years. And three years ago, I started my own business, Be Bold Services, uh, where I do coaching, facilitation, and consulting, all helping social impact organizations and change agents really think um, deeply and critically about living systems and how we can be in better relation and reciprocity with, with the earth and with one another. So that's the work that I do mostly with nonprofit organizations. I also do a lot of work around equity, equity and climate justice, helping organizations connect the past history to the present social and ecological crisis. And that's what I hope to be sharing with you all. Um, just some of the work around how can we start to think about the mental models that we're bringing into our work as ecological leaders and help reframing that conversation for the work we're doing forward. So I will jump in here and get started. So, a lot of the work that I've done has been really based in identity work. And there's been so much conversations over the past, gosh, 10 years, increasingly more about identity and intersectionality and how we navigate the world based on our lived experience. So identity, just to kind of ground us, is just anything that's self-described that you use to describe how you, how you are, who you're um, a member of, any group that you belong to. And it's fluid throughout our lives. So here in this chart, we have this wonderful graph that I love that shows we have this identity and worldview and we move out through all of these layers from primary to secondary to organizational and cultural. And the idea is that we are the only ones that can say how or who we identify with, but that they can change, right? Um, maybe our primary identities are the ones that people will most notice about us, the ones that are maybe less likely to change. Um, but as you move forward and out, right, you get different work experience, you get different cultural experience. You might be a manager one day, you might be a CEO one day, right? Or you might move abroad. And so identity is fluid. It's complex. It's dynamic and helps to add to the complexity of, of, of the human experience. And so identity is really, like I said, just anything that helps you to um, define a, a group or membership that you might um, identify with. And then we have intersectionality when a person identifies right with one or more different identities that my experience a different um, combination or experience of oppression as a result of all of those identities intersecting, but we all have intersectional identities, right? We can't really separate myself as being a woman from being uh, an individual who identifies as black. And so the idea is that when we think and we step back about identity, we can start to see that it's both fluid, but also that um, it helps us to get a better understanding of when we're speaking with people, when we're trying to understand different worldviews or perspectives, what are all the different functions of the self that we're seeing coupled here? Yes, so Kimberly Crenshaw, um, who kind of coined the term intersectionality, um, thanks for dropping that in the chat. Lots of great, great language that's been given to us from folks who are asking these deep questions. All right, so there's also this connection between identity and worldviews. And um, I use a lot of work from um, FSG, they're just a consulting uh, uh, organization that does a lot of systems thinking work. And they basically have given us this definition around um, mental models or worldviews being the habits of thought or the deeply held assumptions or beliefs, right, that help us navigate the world. They guide how we talk, how we think, um, who we are in many ways. So there's a very big connection um, between the, 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 the um, beliefs and assumptions we have and, and the identity that we ascribe to. And what's really interesting, though, is that some worldviews are inherited, right? Things that we picked up as we were born and speaking with our community. Some are institutionalized when we go to school or we go to other places and some are conditioned. And some also tell us what we consider valid or right or wrong or acceptable. So there's also some kind of judgment in there around what worldviews are acceptable or not. And I always like to think about, um, you know, the in the US American context, the founding fathers come bringing worldviews, some of them that were European to a new land, right? Or people who were capitalists or ventures or farmers coming. So all of those worldviews are really, really ingrained in history. And it's really easy for us to forget that connection between time. Or even here with uh, environmentalists, right? I have this graphic here <laughs> because we, I think we've all been maybe that person when you go into a meeting or you're traveling and you go, oh, 
reusable water. I have a water bottle. You can kind of feel the, the eyes of people around you. This idea that like, oh, we should not be using plastic or we need to have, you know, reusable containers. Um, and so again, just like it's really subtle. It's really nuanced. You might have some um, uh, views about what's acceptable or what's not when you go into one group and then you go into a different environment and it can be very, very different, right? So there also is a connection, though, between worldviews and what we call privilege and oppression, right? So we have power that's exercised by one member of a dominant worldview. So if you have a worldview that a large group of people hold or that that power, that uh, worldview or that group with that worldview has more power, more access to resources, more access to information, right? We can create privilege and oppression. And so oppression is this the systemic institutional abuse of power by one group at the expense of others. Right. And some use of force or power to maintain that dynamic. It's an ongoing um, assertion of, of power. Right. And the privilege. Right. Is that that group then has some advantages. They're able to take advantage of things that other people wouldn't do just by nature of belonging or ascribing to that dominant worldview and group. So some examples here that you can see very, very, very um, explicitly. Right. Signs saying Christians only Jews not allowed. Huge anti-Semitic waves that's come through the U.S been reoccurring now here. We see it also when we think about gerrymandering, political battles, right? Who has power? Who gets to say? What does the, what does the vote matter? We see it in, in the U.S. American context and abroad as well around issues of uh, police violence and brutality. But the big thing here is that we have to remember that it's all it's in axes, right? Because identity is so intersectional and because there's so much complexity of the human experience, we might be privileged in one way, but also experience oppression another way. So big thing when I always go to US, I go to conferences and everything's in English, I go, oh my gosh, that's such a privilege that I get to speak in my native tongue, even if we're in an international context. So even as a black woman who's disabled or however I identify, I also have my own privilege. And so this is an invitation for us to think about how all of the intersection of our different identities will create a different, um, I guess, uh, spectrum, right, of the privileges that we may experience in different contexts. And so a lot of the work that I've done, and I think so much of the, the, the challenges that we're facing right now are really around like settler colonial culture. A lot of people will say, you know, white supremacy culture, but I think it's not about, for me, it's not just about whiteness. I think whiteness is a function of that because we have indigenous um, individuals in Ireland and Scotland, right, who are also subjected to settler colonialism. And so I wanted to just do some framing about this as we kind of deep dive deeper into some of the issues that are affecting what I think um, we're facing right now. So how do worldviews become tools for oppression, right? So we talked a little bit about there, there might be a dominant worldview here in the US, maybe capitalism, um, you know, anything like that. But the idea is that there's a power dynamic that's maintained over and over again. And that's usually done, it can be done through violence, assimil assimilation and socializ socialization, right? And at the same time, this is where other identities, worldviews, think about the regenerative culture or think about people who are looking deeply at redefining how we understand sexuality, right? Is that we have this push and pull. And on the other side, we have identities that are marginalized or oppressed or erased. And so I think a little bit about just everything that's happening right now. I have this graphic, uh, this picture on the four horsemen of the apocalypse, because I do very much feel like it's easy for us to get sucked into capitalism, US American void, and not really think about all of the the systems and structures and the ecological crisis that's happening. There's so much death and destruction. Um, and it's it's easy for us to mask to, to be masked and separated from that. But in so many ways, there's four kind of worldviews or mental models that I think are driving a lot of the catastrophes and oppression that we're experiencing now. And so we have paternalism, racism, capitalism, and mechanistic thinking. And those are kind of the four co-conspirators I call of settler colonial culture. That, are, that is the dominant worldview that we see in the U.S. American context, as well as in um, other, other areas abroad. And to go kind of deeper to show really what does this look like for us, right? So I always tell people it's really difficult. I think it's impossible to separate exploitation and violence of oppressed people, whether that's um, disabled, women, black, queer, whatever you, you include under the umbrella of identities that have been oppressed, right? Is that it's 
it's almost impossible to separate their exploitation and violence against them from environmental extraction and degradation, right? So we think about um, this chart I put up here, we have the first enslaved Africans arrived in Virginia to pick cotton and tobacco, right? The extractive comedy coming, changing uh, so much of the original ecosystems, right? Bounty scalping, the government actually saying we're gonna pay people to scalp um, indigenous people, the same time that we have buffaloes being uh, buffalo and hunting, right? Wildly unsustainable, uh, eradicating um, large swath of game animals on the plains, right? Or we think a little bit about later on, right? We have uh, even things like Japanese internment, right? Or the dropping of um, bombing uh, during wars, chemical extraction and the impact on people of color, right? Here and abroad. And so it's really difficult for us to separate those battles from environmental degradation. And it's easy for us to miss the connection because of the way that we talk about the story and the history of harm, especially here in the US. But I do think it's really important for us to focus and think um, of, our, of, our, of our work as not two separate battles. I mean, obviously there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but to see that there's a common connection between um, violence and oppression against marginalized groups and the environmental extraction that we see now. And so to kind of break down this idea of settler colonial culture, you know, it's really important for us to be really specific about what are some of the norms, what are the behaviors, what are the things that we see happening with these different worldviews that can start to create harm, right? So there's some examples here, racism, paternalism. I put mechanism to save space, but you can think of mechanistic thinking. And here's kind of a list of some of the, the behaviors um, that are listed underneath here, right? So racism, you know, individualism, the rugged individual, it's up to the individual, othering and exclusion, right? Us versus them, lots of separation, categorization, erasure, right? Is that we actually want to uh, get rid of or eliminate uh, individuals who may be of a certain race, um, domination and subjugation. Um, there's just all sorts of different little things that we see here. And this is from two really great um, uh, sources that started circulating a couple years ago on the characteristics of white dominance culture and characteristics of white supremacy. So I've kind of updated some of them. But you can see all of these in different ways, and we'll show some examples. Um, paternalism is another one. We've had so so much in the rise of feminism, ecofeminism, and how do we um, explore um, more receiving and less extractive ways of, of moving through the world. So whether that's keeping tabs on people or command and control and surveillance, right? Or saying we're, we're gonna deny the emotional part of the human experience and focus on the rational. Um, and the mechanistic thinking, which I think is a big part of um, what really motivated me is, right, we have this kind of Newtonian view of the world and we can look at celestial bodies and know exactly where they're gonna be, but we realize that life is much more complex than machines, right? We know that um, perfectionism or objectivity is kind of an illusion, right? That there is a, a messiness and a complexity and a circularity of life that's very, very natural and inherent in living systems. And this idea that man is separate from nature is really just a construct, right? Or the idea that technology can fix anything. And then of course you all know capitalism. Capitalism, competition, right? Scarcity mindset, there's not enough for everyone. The winner, the whoever's gonna win is the best suited to win right, or appropriation, we're going to take something from another culture and then we're going to commodify it. Commodification be a big thing, capitalism only being able to see or give value to anything that can be traded or have some type of um, cost associated with it, right? Or the idea that we can just keep growing forever and forever, right? So a lot of people post growth institute saying, keep growing forever, that's actually not part of what happens in natural systems. So these are some of the basic norms um, and behaviors that we see. And I always tell people, is that it's not just that all of these norms are bad, right? They become problematic when they, then they're assumed to be superior or the only way, right? If I got an injury and I had to go to the hospital and I had a doctor, I'd want them to strive for perfection. I'd want them to strive for order, right? I'd want them to do the best that they can. I'd want to get the best you know, technology that they had available to support me. But when it's seen as that's the only way or that it's the, the best way, then that's where we start to get into the harm. And I always think about how can we put settler colonial culture, the European ancestry and heritage on a buffet, on a menu with all these other worldviews that we can actually see them and decenter them in a way that can help us to explore other ways of living and being. So it's not just that all settler colonial culture is bad, right? It's just when it causes harm or when it's meant to be superior. So really, really important piece there that I think some people miss out on.
So I wanted to show you all some examples of this. Um, and then we'll, I want to make sure we have plenty of time for some discussion here. But really framing this in terms of y'all's work, our work collective as ecological leaders, whatever that means in your work, is it's important for us to remember that we have this, this history that's inherited, depending on where you are, it may be different to your place and time. But we see this over and over again in society. You know, one example that I have here is um, just to remind people is that um, a lot of the early leaders in the environmental movement, right, were slave traders. Um, they were eugenicists, meaning that they believed that there was a genetic superiority to individuals who identified as white or European. And they were actively resourcing, supporting and making connections, right, drawing from their networks um, and drawing from their own worldviews that they inherited too, right? So it's important for us to think about some of the early environmental leaders in the US American context who are actually spreading very, very oppressive um, and violent rhetoric, right? In some cases, funding it, but also setting up institutions, right? You know, James Audubon was known for was doing all sorts of shady stuff, making up birds that didn't exist and going into native burial sites. So there's some um, uh, really difficult history that has to be untangled, right? And we have a whole Audubon society that's now helping to also do good and encouraging people to get involved with with um you know uh bird watching and, and um all of those pieces too right um madison grant co-founder of, of the save the redwoods and the bronx zoo right some of the early folks who were trying to be you know conservation and setting conservation rhetoric were also <laughs> segregationists right against uh immigration against labor organizing and put tons of money into it again they inherited those worldviews as well and so part of us is have that perspective eye um, when we're thinking about that work um, and the, the work of, uh, of early leaders and how it impacts us today. Um, I'm not going to spend too much on this, but I love this. I found this really, really great um, uh, history that shows kind of history of race, class, and environmentalism um, from the U.S. Um, and it was done by uh, um, uh the u.s wildlife did like a whole history piece on it so it's linked there you can go see their whole study but um just to briefly look at this and kind of thinking around how we've come full circle right we have you know very early on you uh settlers coming into the u.s and we have kind of up on the top here we've got all of these different bodies of knowledge of environmentalism that come up right we think about um, the European influence and romanticism and transcendence and creating these beautiful stories of like, what is wilderness and nature and what is our responsibility to address as stewards? And we get ecologists like Thoreau asking deep questions about consumption and how we're using natural resources. We start to build out cities that look like Europe here in the US, right? And then all the while, we also have a working class context, right? Protests and demonstrations people asking for workers' rights, right? And of course, we have the ongoing struggle for native sovereignty, as well as enslaved Africans who had come here looking for things like uh, land backs or asking for uh, better management of resources, right? And so this is kind of like three distinct kind of um, areas you can see and how they kind of point. So thinking about uh, land use, uh, working class issues, and issues that were impacted mostly by native and, and um, enslaved Africans coming, right? But as you start to move further closer to here, right, we start to see more and more of what we think of today as like modern day environmentalism. So I always think here, if you look at the regenerative cultural movement, right, after like Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, and we had the first Earth Day, we're sending people to the moon, right? And then in the late 1990s, we start to have radical environmentalism, right? People talking about deep ecology and social ecology and regenerative agriculture and permaculture, right? And this comes out of this tradition, right? Meanwhile, we still have indigenous native black folks who are thinking about environmental justice movement and also calling for the same thing, things that they've been calling for since the very beginning of a lot of this, this, this struggle over um, U.S. American resources. So this is just something for you all to think about, right, of just how that history really shows throughout time um, in all these different contexts. So here's a couple of examples that I'll provide, and then we can maybe open it up for some um, discussion here. Um, I worked in sustainability with a lot of government folks, and so one of the things we always talked about is, oh my gosh, traffic is so bad. How are we gonna figure out our infrastructure? And there's a big infrastructure now bill here in the US, right? So uh, this is a picture of I-4 I in Florida that was built between historic black neighborhood, right? In the 1950s, we had tons of properties that were displaced. And this is a great example of settler colonial culture, right? Bigger is better. We're going to build bigger, 
highways and bigger streets, right? And now we know that that just creates more congestion and more traffic, right? And we know ants and other, other um, natural living systems have wonderful ways for how we can move resources that are much, um, much, much uh, better for the environment for people. But there's one example. So bigger is better, bigger roads. Economic models. This is a study showing somebody trying to create a cost associated with certain ecosystems. What's the cost, right, of a coastal estuary or seagrass forest, right? How can we put a cost to it so that it has value? So we think about commodification, right? Capitalism is like, we can only see this forest for if it has a dollar or a cent or if it can be traded. Everything has to be commodified or if it has no value. So things that really matter to us, like loving someone or taking care of someone, we can't really put a cost on that. But capitalism would do a really good job trying to do that, right? Putting a price on carbon is also a form of commodification, right? Some good things that happen to drive the market, maybe some people saying we don't want to have market-based solutions, right, to get out of this narrative of capitalism being able to kind of uh, be saved if we're going to go through this ecological crisis. So a really big piece there. Consumption is a big one. This is a big one for me. Um, a lot of people, especially Lily, have said, you know, we need to stop eating meat to save the planet. And wherever you stand on that, it's important for us to remember is that a lot of the early work that was done to get consumers to recycle, reduce their waste, were actually campaigns by corporate companies, right? And that we focus sometimes on that instead of going, why aren't we holding the 100 count companies that are accountable for 70% of emissions, right? And tons of plastic waste and concentrated animal feedlots and poor treatment of animals. Aren't we holding them responsible instead of people who have little access to power over the type of food that they eat or where they're able to get food or the quality, right? So just thinking a little bit about like, yeah, how is this maybe a function of individualism, right? It's up to the individual to make a decision rather than holding collective entities responsible and accountable for their impact, right? Another one that we've seen here, um, you know, we've talked about the story. I know when I first came into the environmental movement, people were talking a lot about polar bears. That was like a very, trees and polar bears were like a very big piece and they still are. They're part of our ecosystem of solutions. But how are we centering them instead of indigenous or native people, right, who are who are um, relying on them for their way of life, right? We think about activists in the global south who are experiencing, in some ways, far greater impacts, right? Especially individuals who are in Pacific and Islander communities, right, whose whole whole, whole islands are underwater, right, as being decentered from this story of who gets to be the speaker, who gets to speak up and talk about climate activism, right? or even things like permaculture, regenerative agriculture, nature-based solutions, all of these are indigenous and Afro-indigenous perspectives, right? That in some ways are um, being uh, pushed by the modern environmental movement for good, we need them, but without the recognition that a lot of these technologies are indigenous ways of being, right? And that we actually are returning back to those, those technologies, those stories, right? And the wisdom to help guide us forward. But if there's a disconnection there, right, we still have some type of othering and appropriation that happens. And it's a little, it's nuanced. It's much more nuanced than that, right? Lots of different cultures have used different techniques. But the idea is there's there's ways even in our activism work, right, that we start to see that, right? And like the rights of nature, exactly, right? The idea that living that like trees and forests are relatives, right? Um, that they have rights, right? All of these different perspectives, those are different worldviews that can help us to really recalibrate and think about solutions to the, 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 the climate crisis. I think I have one more example here. Oh no, okay, no, that was the last example, okay. So to close out here, I wanted to just give you all some framing, both about some of the big challenges that face up and what I see as the biggest opportunity because um, one of the things in Afro-Indigenous culture is like futures thinking. So if anyone's ever read like Octavia Butler or like Afro-Punk Future, it's like this whole thing that builds off this really rich tradition of West African idea of like, how do we create our future and be storytellers and visionaries, right, for future generations? And so I want to also make sure that we think about the opportunity that's here with us and, op and bring that insight and um, optimism into our work as well. And so much of that means we have to really be aware that we've become numb to oppression in some ways. We've been taught to repress our feelings about the ecological crisis and we're all maybe in different places, but we have to remember that so much of that is a process of our socialization. From the moment that we were born, right, there was messages and news and organizations and media and people kind of telling us how we should think and shaping our world for us, right? Systems of oppression are designed to keep intact, right? 
And so even though we were born into maybe a certain context, right? And through all of these different ways, we can see how it was enforced, different worldviews, different beliefs, what's acceptable, what's right, what's not right, right? Is that we start to get this dissonance. We start to feel the oppression. We start to feel the impacts of these systems when they are oppressive and they're not life affirming. And we always have the choice to act, right? We can either choose to just stay with the status quo and just say, you know, I'm just going to dig in right now. Or we can say, I'm going to do something. I want to make waves. I want to be an ecological leader. I want to see a different way. And it's important just to think about this cycle of socialization, right? Because once we start to break through systems of oppression, we start to experience stress, right? These systems don't want to be broken, right? They were built um, and designed to keep power and balanced, right? And so it's on us to start to think about what is our role of socialization? How can we both take care of ourselves, but also be really realistic, right? About the challenges and the systems of oppression that we need to dismantle. So my kind of ask or my, my, my antidote, the medicine to all of this, right? Is if we think of settler colonial culture as like all this combination of things like individualism and urgency and authoritarianism and paternalism and command and control, right? Is what if there were other ways of living, working and leading, right? So the antidote I always say to settler colonial culture, paternalism, mechanistic thinking, right? Is feminism, right? living systems thinking, radical belonging, all of these new kind of worldviews and mental models that are coming up in the social impact and, and um, sustainability space. And that these life affirming worldviews and values can be an antidote and can be a medicine to balance out these other influences, right? And the other thing is that they also have a collective impact on all of us, right? They move society towards awareness and accountability and also help us to start the process of healing so that we can actually build momentum for new policies and new practices that are much more sustainable, value aligned, right? For us and the rest of the living world. Thank you for this quote, Kisa. There's no end to what a living world will demand of you. So all of these ideas are fresh and new for us to explore and new, new energies I think are unleashed when we start to tap into these other ways of being that are really life affirming. We can feel it probably in this space different than if you go to other spaces. And the opportunity that's there for us, right? As you all know this, we get to challenge the story of separation that man is separate from nature and start to go, oh wow, we actually are a part of this beautiful tapestry, an ecosystem of wonder, of information and resources flowing beautifully. And we get to be a part of that complexity, bringing humanity back into the story of the living world and creation. So you all know all of this stuff about life adapting and evolving and creating life conducive to life, but this is one part of the opposite, right? When we start to think about life affirming values, regenerative culture, right? Is that we also have to remember that there's a body, a rich body of social wisdom and technology that's also available to us. So in, a different, in addition to thinking differently about how we are part of nature, connected with nature, right? We also have to remember that there are tons of solutions, technologies and experts in dismantling settler colonialism, right? And we've seen this with the pandemic. This is a picture of the Black Panthers doing mutual aid, providing food to community centers, right? Great models for community organizing, creating um, sustainability. We see this when we think about hyper-local solutions for healing governance models that are native-led, stewardship of, of ecological systems, right? We think about how do we have massive shifts in collective behavior and we know that with Gandhi's work and other international um, leaders who have thought deeply about ways that we can deconstruct the impacts of colonialism, right? And take back control of resources or not control, but be better in community with resources um, and, and be able to be part of that conversation about how they're used, right? Is we have models against colonialism and they're queer, black and led by people of color. But if we don't center those stories and say, hey, these are leaders, these are the experts, how can we bring them in and bring in that knowledge? Then we bypass that project, that process, and we actually then end up um, supporting settler colonialism again. And it's very nuanced, all these new stories and old stories coming together. But I think this is one of the biggest opportunities for really just um, decentering settler colonialism in the US American context and we think about ecological leadership. So we have technologies, we have expertise, we have leaders and technologies and also new ways of being that can help us to create an ecosystem of solutions that's much more life affirming. <laughs>